For this video, we're gonna have a short look at Alphen, the Dutch green renewable transition company who is specializing in who is specializing in the electricity grid of the future. They sell battery storage, they sell electric vehicle charging, as well as smart grids, basically everything that you need energy-wise when it comes to the green transition. For this reason, they are a relatively young company, so there is not that much data available on their financials, but let's see what we do know and see if we can forecast this company into the future. So just looking at their revenue here in 2017, we can see that they have been growing very steadily and very fast for the past six years. They started with 74 million euros and they ended up with 439. Now, as you might have noticed, we're looking at very low numbers here because Alphen is still very much a very young and small company com compared to some of the other companies that we've looked at. But nevertheless, I think their growth story is quite inspiring and who knows where they will be in the future. Because what we can see here when it comes to their revenue growth is that they have been growing at big double digits for the past few years. 36, 41, 32, 76 here in the final year. Now, of course, we do know that many countries, municipalities, firms are investing into the green energy transition. And I think Elfin will probably take those tailwinds and use them to really bolster their revenue and earnings. Because looking at earnings, we can see a very similar picture as with their revenue, which is to say 302% here in 2019, and it's only been going up from there. They started off six years ago with an earnings of 4.9 billion, which has risen all the way to 79.3 here in 2022. Absolutely amazing numbers, 59% annual compounding growth rate. Looking at that debt level, we can see that that debt level is overall relatively small. Now, so of course this makes you wonder how are they able to grow so fast? Where do they get the funds from? Well, as you can see here, the, the difference between 2019, 2020, when it comes to their uh, access cash on hand, they suddenly got a big stimulus in money, which is to say that they diluted their share count and that's how they were able to raise money to keep on expanding their business. So this brings us to market cap, an absolutely amazing story to be told here. 45% on average for the past six years. Enterprise value about the same because like I mentioned, the debt level is relatively low. They do not really want to over leverage themselves. EV EBITDA ratio, we can see the big, big double digit numbers here, which is to be expected of a company that is expected to have really large growth here in the future. Now, of course, their growth is very much priced into this multiple already to a certain extent, because this is not the multiple premium that you would pay for a company that has a single digit growth. On average, their EV EBITDA ratio is 35.5 times, which is to say it takes about 35 and a half years currently with their current earnings for Alphen to pay back the entirety of their market cap. So this brings us to the net debt to EBITDA. We can see here that they are very unleveraged as a growth company here. So there's not much risk of bankruptcy. Now there is risk of additional share dilution, which I'm sure will happen in the future. But when it comes to bankruptcy, I don't see a very high likelihood of that happening. So this brings us to their cash flow from operations. And what we can see here in 2017, they posted about 1 million cash flow from operations, which has risen all the way to 20 million here in 2020 and back to zero in 2022. Now you might be wondering why is their cash flow zero here in 2022, even though they booked a record earnings? Well, this is because they had to invest in a lot of inventory. They had to invest in many different assets. And it's also what like I noted here as well, intangible assets. So what Elephant does is they invest is that they invest about the same amount as their capital expenditure. So about so about two million here and five million here in intangible assets. Now so what does intangible assets really mean? So intangible assets is basically an investment in something as the name suggests is intangible. So we're talking about goodwill, like a good reputation for their company. We're talking about patents because of course their technology is cutting edge and that's why they're able to grow so much and they're going to have to get the patents for that. They also buy patents from some competitors to use for their own business. So this is very much what they've been investing in heavily as well when it comes to their business structure, intangible assets on top of the usual capital expenditure for plants and equipment and maintenance. 
So of course this means that there are occasions where their free cash flow is quite low. Like here in 2022, even though they posted record earnings, their free cash flow was negative because they had to buy so much inventory, because they have to invest in capital expenditure, because they have to invest in intangible assets, which is still very much pushing the growth story for Alphen. They very much invest every penny that they have into additional growth for their company. So this brings us then to the shares outstanding. Like I mentioned in 2019, they diluted their share count to raise some additional money to keep on fueling their growth machine, which is completely fair. And I think I'd very much prefer this instead of over leveraging themselves with debt. I think they're making the right choice here by utilizing shareholder money to keep on boosting their growth. So a free cash flow per share is the amount of free cash flow divided by the amount of shares outstanding. Now, again, we're looking at low numbers here. Uh, because it's a very small company. But nevertheless, what we can see here is at the moment that they don't have to invest as much into uh, additional planned equipment, maintenance, intangible assets like patents or goodwill, that they're actually already making a pretty decent free cash flow per share. So this brings us then to the price per share. Now I do want to note that they officially went public in March of 2017 and their fiscal year starts uh, or, or ends and starts at the uh, January 1st. So this number of 10 euros here was the initial IPO price, but this was a price that was from March and not from January. So do take this into consideration. But what we can see after that is that their share price has been skyrocketing here between the years of 2019, 2020, where they saw a earnings growth of 302%. And of course, this attracted so many eyes of so many investors and really started their growth story. Now for the past three years, they've remained stable around the 18 euros mark. Now, uh, in the meantime, they had a high of about 114, 115 euros, I do believe, but it's come down a little bit since then because of course there are some economic headwinds currently facing us. So it brings us to the free cash flow yield and it's quite difficult to use this really because they have some negative free cash flow years as well. So on average it says it's 0.3%. I think that's a bit on the low end for sure because of the negative numbers here. But uh, yeah, we'll see what we do with that in the future. So a quick and dirty projection for a company like this because it is very difficult to project a growth company into the future because the moment that they miss their growth targets like one year or two year in a row, um, their valuation starts to come down drastically. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take their growth number where historically they've been at 59%, absolutely insane numbers. And clearly with the multiples that they still have, Investors are expecting this growth to somewhat continue into the future. So I'm going to give them a 50% for 2023, so down 9% from their average. And I'm going to reduce that by 5% every single year, all the way until the bottom level of 10% here. Because I do not expect them to keep on maintaining this level of growth, because I think this level of growth is absolutely ridiculous. At the same time, I do think that they're still a very small company and there's definitely, definitely a lot more growth to be had. I think they're mainly operating in the Netherlands right now, but I'm sure they will be expanding outwards to different countries later on, which will very much increase their market and their market size. And of course, by extension, their uh, earnings levels and their share price. So I do think there's a very solid growth story for Alpha into the future because renewables are the future by and large anyway. So I think Alpha is very well positioned to make use of this. But I do want to be conservative with my estimate and I'm going to say that that growth is going to decrease 5% every single year. When it comes to a market multiple, I'm going to give them a market multiple of 15 times. Now when I look historically, it's been a lot higher than this. But I think that is because of course the growth that they're currently seeing is very much valued into their share price. It's very much valued into their multiples. And I think that the moment that the earnings growth starts to come down, the multiple will also shrink and subtract. So I think 35 is way too high for a company 10 years into the future, unless they're able to maintain this growth, but I'm really not sure they will. So I want to be conservative. I'm going to say 15 times market multiple because they still have double digit growth in our projection 10 years from now. And they definitely warrant some additional premium when it comes to that multiple. So I'm going to give them 15 times, which is the lowest number here that they have in 2019. And I think it's a nice conservative estimate for us to look into the future. So that gives me an enterprise value of 13 billion 10 years from now, to which we subtract the debt, add the cash, gives me a market cap of about the same number 
divided by the amount of shares outstanding. Now more than likely the amount of shares outstanding will increase in the future as they will continue to raise capital on the uh, dime of the shareholders as they should. So I'm expecting this number to go up. But because I've already been quite conservative with my earnings growth as well as with my multiple, I just want to give them this number as it is because I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Maybe they will not dilute shares because they're able to uh, sustain themselves. Who knows? So this brings us to the free cash flow model. So I'm going to do a very similar thing when it comes to their free cash flow, which is to say I'm going to take a positive number here from them of 2021 and I'm going to increase that by 50%. Now I do expect them to grow their free cash flow faster than they grow their earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization because at a certain point, I don't expect them to invest as heavily into capital expenditure. I don't expect them to invest as heavily into intangible assets. And I do expect their cash flow numbers to increase relative to their EBITDA. Because I expect them to be more mature in operating their business. They have their plans figured out. They have their facilities figured out. And I think that's going to reduce the cost, which will then increase our free cash flow. So I'm going to give them a higher free cash flow percentage compared to their earnings. I'm going to say 50% increase for the first four years. And then I'm also going to reduce this down by 5% every single year. I'm also going to attach a 4% free cash flow yield to that which I think is very much on the high end of any of their historic levels. But like I mentioned, the moment that their growth starts coming down, I expect their free cash flow yield to go up and their earnings multiple to come down. And just for me to be conservative here, because I do know that their free cash flow yield will increase in the future, I'm going to go ahead and give them a 4% yield. So when I take both these numbers and cut them down the middle, I get an average share price 10 years from now of 431 euros and 17 cents. Right now on the stock market, I can buy as many shares as I want of Alphen for 78 euros. This gives me a compounding annual growth rate on the stock market of 18.6% annually. If I include the cash flow, which I do expect them to be producing in the, in the near future, and include that into our calculations, I get an internal rate of return of 22.9% year over year return. Now, on average, the stock market returns about 10% a year, and I think when it comes to that, Alphen is very well positioned to beat the stock market in the future. But of course, I do want to make the additional side note that this is very much dependent on their growth story. The moment that their growth starts to come down, uh, even one year or even like two years of, of neutral growth, and then it go, goes back to 45%, what we do see already is that their stock price is going to decrease drastically, right? One bad year of, of uh, below expectation growth is going to reduce their share price immensely 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 because this is very much baked into the prediction and the moment that this part of the prediction does not hold true their their stock price is going to come down so let's have a look here at our little table what happens if the price goes up what happens if the price comes down if the price goes down by 30 percent to about the 56 euros range which i don't expect it ever will again but just in case it does it gives me an IRR of 27.8%, which is an absolutely amazing return for anyone. But even if the price goes up a little bit, even if it goes to about 85, 90, maybe even 100 euros, it gives me an IRR of 19.2%, which is still very attractive for any investor. Now, of course, it is a growth company and things can happen. It's not as steady as a telecom company, which is very sticky revenue because people need their internet or like with the grocery store because people need their food. Of course, with Elfin, uh, you take a higher risk when it comes to that. But of course, higher risk can go hand in hand with a higher reward. And I think Elfin is still very well positioned into the future because renewable, like I mentioned a few times, might be the future of energy uh, a few decades from now. So... So this was a short look at Alphen. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.